Hello and welcome to the Faith and Reason podcast on Paving the Way Home. We're delighted to be joined today by Father Luke Janssen in uh, Cork. So, Father Luke, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. So, you're uh, not a native of Cork, as people may have guessed from uh, from your accent there, and well, maybe not in in the earlier words, but they will guess as, you, as once, you're once talking. Once to say a few through, other uh, words, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am um, so, originally. I'm I'm from the Netherlands, so I have been, uh, but I've been in Ireland for a good while now. Um, but I think my accent has 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 changed. Uh, I don't know what I'm accused of being from now at this stage. But uh, yeah. uh, I'm from the Netherlands, uh, but in Ireland now for uh, what is it? Almost twenty years, I think, something like eighteen years. Yeah, so a long time. Okay, well, do you know, it's it's funny, I'm always torn between calling it Holland and the Netherlands, and I never know what I'm supposed to call it. So uh, what, what am I supposed to call it? You, you go with the Netherlands. So why, why do I call it Holland? Well, I mean, I suppose uh, we use Holland a lot. Like, even if you see the, the football team, it always has Holland on it. So uh, I suppose Holland, technically, I would say, would be a part of, of the country. Um, so the where Amsterdam and the major cities are would technically be Holland, uh, but the whole country is officially called the Netherlands. So, but uh, I'm not really fussy about it either way. So, uh, <laughs> okay. So, your Holland would, or the Netherlands wouldn't necessarily be uh, known as a kind of a hugely Christian country, a, a Catholic country. Um, it certainly, wouldn't be. Uh, Catholic in in any major way. I think it's it's quite a small percentage would be Catholic. Is that right? Yeah, about thirty percent. Thirty. Yeah. yeah, that's better than I thought actually. But um, but you your background you weren't raised Catholic or or anything like that. So yeah, uh, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah, so I suppose, um, I mean, it is it's right. Nowadays, the Netherlands would be be kind of not really seen as a, as a Christian country, but it was very much so for a very long time. Um, yes, it would have been predominantly, uh, uh, would have been uh, uh, Protestant, Dutch Reformed would be the religion, but the South uh, is, is predominantly Catholic. Um, so there would have been, yeah, there would, there was good bit Catholics as well. And uh, so there was a great missionary spirit, especially in the 60s and, and 70s. And, and there was a lot of, uh, about a lot, lot, lot of happened then. But it had completely collapsed then, I suppose, in the 70s, 80s, I, I expect. I, I'm not that well up on the exact history. Um, and uh, nowadays, yeah, I mean, the, the percentage that a little, a lot of people, I suppose, to a certain extent, su subscribe still to being Christian in some kind of a way. But practically, most people, uh, most younger people are, uh, are not so much um, like the same for myself. When I was when I grew up, I I did go to a, what we would say a public school, so a non-Christian school. So I wouldn't have had any um, uh, any prayers and and things like that in my uh, during the day or anything like that. Um, I didn't even even have any religious education, so I didn't learn anything about God. I didn't uh, learn much about the history of Christianity apart from what you just get in general history. So I wouldn't have known an awful lot about it um at all and uh, like if you don't get any any education in that at all it's just something that is it's it, it's more history a part of history than it is anything else to you uh, i never had really any interest in it yeah i see what you mean and, and like okay so if you weren't exposed to it, that's fair enough over here like my experience growing up is we were very exposed to it but possibly to the point where familiarity breeds contempt you know and it's just it's kind of second nature but it's not second nature in the kind of the way of um we're living it all out so easily uh more just kind of it's yeah there's so much kind of christianity around us um and you know we're we're doing we're a catholic culture and you know we're doing the catholic things but um a lot of the time we were doing the catholic things on a sunday morning and then when we leave, we wouldn't give any thought to it. You know, we might say some prayers in the evening, but um, particularly if we wanted something. But, um, you know, it, it just we didn't give a whole lot of thought of it, you know, about it kind of from one end of the week to the other. Um, but I suppose there is something in that, though, that deep down when the going 
if the going ever did get tough or something like that, we kind of were always, we wouldn't have had a good understanding of God, um, but we'd be able to kind of know that there is a bigger picture, there is a God there, and, and that would have been something that would have been ingrained in us. But for you, would you ever have kind of given a whole lot of thought to the bigger questions or anything like that? Um, I, I suppose I did. I, I would always have said I would always have believed that there is something out there. You know, I didn't completely believe in. I, I did believe in in reason. I mean, as in as in purpose, I should say. Um, I did believe in purpose uh, to a certain extent. So. Um, yeah, no, I would always have uh, believed that there was something out there, even believed in some kind of the supernatural, but it wasn't really relevant to my life. It wasn't something that was, I suppose, tangible or that was, uh, yeah, something that made a difference. So even, even while I, I kind of believed in it, uh, it didn't really feature in my life and it wasn't something I, I put an awful lot of thoughts to. I suppose I, I would have... Um, uh, yeah, I would have brought up that we can explain everything. We can explain where the world comes from, why we are who we are, how we got there, and all these kind of things. There was no need for a God. And the only thing I knew, as I said, was a little bit from a history, uh, from religion. But it seemed to me more, more to be for some people who didn't have anything else to believe in. If you don't have much, it's good to have hope, you know, from some kind of like, oh, you're going somewhere else. I mean, at least there's something to kind of live for. Uh, but I suppose in the Western world, we don't need that. So uh, why would you believe in, in a God that science has proved not to be at least necessary? Um, and uh, I think I was, I was pretty content with it. But I think to a certain extent, I would never, I wouldn't have, I, I would never say that I, I was an atheist, I think. Um, but I would just be a practical an atheist, I suppose, to a certain extent. But I mean, it would be agnostic. It was not a question that, uh, uh, that was really relevant for me and I just didn't didn't really think too much about it. There was enough other things to do, you know? Yeah, I know what you mean. And and I suppose the other thing too is, you know, in the teenage years we tend not to give a whole lot of thought to to those things anyway. Um, you know, generally and, and I think mm -hmm. I think also there's kind of something too that you were very much of the the reason kind of um, you know, kind of the, the school of things and and you know the science school of things. I suppose on the other the other extreme uh, on the other side of that is probably the kind of the um maybe there, there can be the superstitious side of of things um i'm i'm more talking about you were on 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 one extreme but i'm talking about maybe where i was at different times are are little things that maybe if i said if i saw a homeless person or something like that i might have kind of thought oh yeah i'll say a prayer for them that you know god will help them not kind of realizing that my Christian duty was that no, I'm I'm supposed to be the answer to that prayer. I'm you know it's it's God through me can help that person or or whatever. And I'd kind of um, yeah, I, I wasn't putting those things together. So I suppose there's just two very different extremes there. But your your journey then um, took you to Ireland. Was it after college or during college? Yeah, just uh, towards the end of college. So. Um... I suppose I did my four years uh, degree in mechanical engineering, and then I came to to Ireland as part of my um, my graduation project. So I had to do a project for three months, um, and it had to be kind of a defined project which I could uh, could finish, and then I could write thesis on it, and that would be the basis for my final year graduation. So that is what I I, uh, I arranged to do with Philips, uh, who are starting up a, a factory in Mexico. And that's why I was supposed to go, but that fell through about a month uh, towards the mid-December. Mid it fell through uh, because there wasn't any specific project, so the college didn't accept it. And then uh, I hadn't have anything. And in Galway, there was a possibility of doing a project. Uh, another uh, student was going there as well, so I decided to, uh, to go with him and to go to Galway to do my graduation there. Um, I think the teacher thought that I wanted to go abroad because I, I was meant to go to Mexico. But then um, I, it wasn't necessarily what I wanted, but I mean, it was the only thing it was an offer. So I found myself on a plane to, uh, to Ireland instead of Mexico. Um, and uh, yeah, that's why I did my graduation for, uh, I suppose it was four months in total, probably back in, uh, in around May uh, was, the, was the end of it. 
Okay, and at the end of that then, so did you think at that point, so when you were coming to Ireland initially, you were coming for four months in your mind. Um, did you think at the end of that, did you think that um, you were finished with Ireland or, or, or were you going to look for kind of work in Ireland or were you going to look for work at home? Well, I was, I was planning on doing a master's and uh, Phillips had a master class, which I, I was planning to continue uh, to do. Um, but I also got a scholar of an officership, a uh, scholar, an, an offer of a scholarship um, in Ireland with the, the research office in the college. So then I decided that I might as well stay here because uh, the scholarship is always good. You get paid for uh, doing your studies. So um, uh, I thought it made sense just to kind of, uh, yeah, just to stay here and to, uh, to do that. Um, so I accepted to do that and to start this September uh, to do my research for my master's uh, and had some friends here at the States and some of them stayed on for another year. So uh, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a bad time. Uh, we enjoyed it, especially there's a lot of foreign students and we kind of all came together. Um, so it was, uh, it was a good time. And um, to carry my time over then, I um, got a summer job in one of the multinational companies here, uh, well, not here in Norway, <laughs> here in Ireland. Um, and uh, I suppose that is where, yeah, that's why I started to do a bit of work over the summer. And then I actually changed my, my plans because with that company, then I, I found a project that was more interesting and uh, got a scholarship for that. Uh, and I started my research there. Okay. And then it's at that point, there was um, a man that you were working with kind of, uh, kind of entered your life in a, in a, a kind of a more um, dramatic way, I suppose, in, in kind of... Uh, the, the, there was a, a man called uh, Basil, I believe. Would you like to tell us a little bit about, about him and how that came to be? Yeah, so um, in, the, in the office where I was working, um, that is where Basil was working as well. And he, and, uh, he started to, to come up to me and uh, have discussions about religion. Um, and I suppose it was just interesting, this, this, Dutch, this Dutch guy that came in and didn't really believe in anything. Now, he, I, would, I must say it wasn't, it wasn't unique. He talks with everybody and anybody about God. So, I mean, he is a, he's, he's quite outspoken about his faith. Uh, but you see, the, the difference was that although I, didn't, I was never really approached, I suppose, about the question of God or anybody to talk with me about it, I suppose the, the interesting thing with Vessel was that he didn't necessarily start to talk about uh, the Bible or anything like that, but he challenged me on my uh, on my scientific, uh, I, I suppose, understanding. So um, we started talking about things like uh, the universe and uh, uh, the Big Bang, where do things come from? So rather than it just being about the fundamental things of Christianity or something like that, which I probably would have easily rejected, he challenged me rather to enter into a discussion um about the mechanics of the universe and things like that so he instead of just kind of ramming down your throat was just everything he knew or you know that this is what you should be doing or that kind of thing he he more went out and met you where you were at so for you it was a scientific thing for someone else it could be something else but he went out to instead of just telling you you have to be here you have to know this he went out to you and i think that's that's a very important thing mm -hmm. yeah and and in ex exactly as you said it is what to kind of to first start talking with somebody at at something they have interest in um and to kind of start building that relationship and i suppose and then starting to challenge me as well um to on on my my beliefs i suppose i was just rattling off what i would have learned on secondary school biology and all these kind of uh, kind of things but it was it wasn't really that much uh, information to go on once I discovered that Bessel is uh, fairly knowledgeable <laughs> so I had to do a lot of research there myself to actually uh, yeah to be able to argue with him and, 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 and properly uh, talk with him uh, about these things. I think that's that's great because I think that you know um, if you're told like you know, if you're told, especially when you're in your 20s, whatever, if you're told like, oh, this is what you should believe or that's what you should believe. I think there's kind of a or you should be over here doing this. I think there can be a kind of a, a thing among us where we say, no, I'm, I'm actually fine where I am. I'm happy where I am. Whereas when someone comes to us and they challenge the actual 
ground and beliefs that we stand on you know it's kind of come to us see what do we believe and challenge those with with questions and 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 giving different information you know and and and, and really getting into question you kind of realize that the ground you're standing on is quite shaky and kind of disappears fairly mm -hmm. fast so uh, yeah i think that it's a great approach so so what was it then kind of well actually before i go into that i i want to concentrate a small little bit on on basil first so you say he was he was proud of his faith obviously if he's going speaking to people and things like that but um but if basil was someone who was living a kind of um a part-time christian kind of life if he's if he can talk about it sometimes but then you know he's a very maybe he could be a very immoral man or he if you knew like a, a, we'll say the likes of a, a christmas party or a work night out that he's living very immorally or he's just he's just not nice to people or he's you know different things would that have maybe switched you off a little bit to him initially yeah, I do think it's important uh, that uh, that obviously that we we kind of uh, we live the way according to what we, we preach, um, and uh, to to be an example. And <laughs> an interesting thing that uh, well, there's probably not too many people listening to young Basil, but some people might. I mean, it, Basil is is definitely not your let's say your 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 kind of uh, what you would expect to be saint. Um, he has definitely has his own little ways, and I'm sure his wife can tell tell you lots about that. Um, but he he definitely uh, lived kind of uh, very. I mean, he, he definitely believed in what he uh, he proclaimed, and he would live according to it. Even that uh, that of course, but he was a very normal person as well. I mean, in just kind of uh, in in argument tempers and in, in just the, the usual kind of you know interaction. So it was very natural um uh, but also uh but he would also he, he would live what he believes by yeah no I, I think that's that's an important thing here because um you know i i've heard your story before um but so I'm, I'm kind of more going down avenues that i haven't asked you before and things and trying to you know um well obviously our, a lot of our listeners won't have have heard your story before but what i'm kind of struck by with this is I suppose it's it's the power of authentic witness in, in a way. And, you know, we're all called to preach the gospel. Um, and then, you know, there's that famous, you know, preach the gospel, but only when necessary, you know, use words. And uh, Father Cullum Mannion was on uh, this podcast before. And, you know, he mentioned about that line. He said, sometimes we can, um, we can hide behind that one and kind of think that, you know, we never have to use words and we can kind of use it as a, an out clause. But, um, you know, I'm just thinking myself at work, the, the idea of broaching Christianity um, with, with an atheist, it's just, um, you know, with or with atheist, agnostic, wherever you're at, it's still one of those things that it takes a lot of courage. Um, no, it also takes a lot of, faith as well you know it takes a deep faith that will probably provide the you know it'll provide that courage but it does take courage and um i'm very i'm very impressed by it um because you know we're all afraid of being kind of judged as in a way it's like if if i'm shut down i'll be that weird holy joe kind of guy who's just you know that's that so what i'm impressed by with, with basil is that you know he had that conviction to just step out and and um because that does take courage yeah and there's, there's not that many people who do that i mean i don't know if i i, I really have and had anybody else in my life who actually would come up to me and, and talked about this you know um and, and i know Bassett does to a lot of people i mean yes and he has brought some people to to back to the faith or or introduce them to the faith and some are not interested i mean that is kind of the nature of it of it but i mean he, he is is consistent in doing it which is a real example because yeah like you said most people don't uh, most people don't um uh, really uh, re really go out get out of their comfort zone i suppose and i include I myself into that as well and and like you know what i'm even just thinking like you're not even someone who 
had a a vague kind of um a vague upbringing in the faith or you know that kind of which you watched like you hadn't been baptized or or anything so it's um i'm correct in saying that yeah mm -hmm. yeah no i was baptized in ireland yeah 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 so like that's um that's amazing like fair play to him and i'm but i'm just struck by the the power of, of that authentic witness because it's one of those it's one of those things that so often now i remember a priest saying to me before um he spoke about the dangers actually of um when young catholics uh it's good for young catholics to come together and you know and and share the faith and and, and pray together and things but it's very important then for them to also go out into the world whereas there can be a tendency at times to very much stick together only have catholic friends and you know only share lives together and kind of excluding all others excluding the world and i remember a priest saying to me before that um you know he said that kevin he said you must it's very important to to stick with you know these people stick stick with you know some of your friends that um that you, maybe you don't have as much in common with anymore and so on but he said that uh, i remember the priest saying to me that he said kevin he said you are the only you are the only link between them and the faith now he said that because he said um the priest said they won't get the faith from me he said i won't get to speak to people like that he said we're we're cut off you you are that bridge so and you know he actually he, he said a line to me that kind of um he said a quote to me that kind of struck me he just said he said kevin you are the salvation of that person <laughs> you know and, and when when i heard it i was like wow it struck me about how i live and even the you know the messages I might share with them are, you know, things like that. And, you know, um, so that's kind of, you know, again, like you say that Basel was probably the only place you'd have got it. And um, in the same way. So it's, it's just the, the power that we really have in our, the capability and power that we have in our words with other people. Yeah. And I think that's, that is, uh, like I said, it's so important. To, to be aware of that and that that we have to take serious to, to go out and proclaim the gospel to the end of the world and that um, we are commissioned to do that um and and one of the things which is a completely different subject but i mean one of the things that i'm so interested in at the moment is like how they they do the the organizations like focus in the us or cco in canada who they really focus on that to actually empower uh, lay people i suppose young people lay people in general um, to really become missionary disciples and actually learn how to to approach others, to walk with them as authentic friends, but then also have the courage and to introduce them uh, to the faith because more and more it is going to be like it's the one to one. Like I wouldn't the 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 whole going to the scientific side of things and 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 the, and eventually the Bible and. And coming to a conclusion that okay maybe this god exists and and then starting to pray i mean that is not something that happens in went for a cup of coffee you know i mean that is something that happened over i don't know it's a three four or five months in total um and then each day almost so you, you do need that continuous uh uh contact with people especially when people be are, are i don't know anything about the faith and have to be introduced to it gently uh, or have to be as supposed to be explained properly if they have never really got a proper education in it. And the only way you can do that is if you have an authentic friendship and 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 as myself as a priest or, or others, I mean, so often we don't get into that uh, in, into the these possibilities or actually having those normal conversations and and gently leading people little step a little step towards discovering the truth. Uh, that will only happen if we have a if we have authentic. Uh, uh, friendships and that is where i suppose uh, everybody is involved because otherwise it won't happen yeah and so if we can just go back to basil's approach to you initially is is that is, is it more true you or or unloading facts on you that that kind of got things moving initially I would say that it was just questioning things. So I can go to a few examples if you like. Um, yeah. So for example, we, we 
uh, starting with the, the Big Bang, which I would be a theory that would be taught at school. So it would be taught that, okay, at one uh, point there was this, this, this big, whatever, nuclear explosion, this big explosion, and the whole universe comes from one point and, and goes out, and that's how it forms. And we can see the universe expanding, and so it all adds up. And it would be something like that, that he would kind of start asking me and he would throw in, for example, like, do you know that this theory was uh, was actually proposed by a priest? It's a priest that came up with the Big Bang Theory uh, and Einstein actually didn't like it. Um, so uh, then you kind of like, you, you kind of start to kind of wonder, okay, is this a curveball? What is the reason for this, you know? And you, you would kind of put questions in which I then had to either I knew or I talked about or I had to research, and um, then you kind of you, you you kind of come to the, for example, in the, in the case of the Big Bang, you come to the the conclusion, okay, but what this Big Bang that is all fine that that happens, but where does the Big Bang come from? I mean, the Big Bang doesn't Big Bang itself out of nothing. Nothing comes from nothing, as far as I, we know. So you kind of have to, have to postulate something external that caused it, even if it was an energy or something like that because things like that just don't happen with no reason. I mean, uh, and so then you can kind of get a little bit philosophical and you can look at St. Thomas Aquinas and the five ways, which were not necessarily meant as a, as a proof of God, but as an illustration on how we can reason ourselves towards, uh, towards things. So we can, uh, we, can, uh, we, can, we can look at, whatever this is a few examples, but it is, um, what, what would we say, the prime move, or there has to be something that is not moved itself. Something has to, what is not created itself has to create things because otherwise uh, things, this, nothing would happen. Um, for example, you can, you can illustrate it. Like if you put a whole row of don dominoes, you would make it thousands and millions of kilometers long. If nobody picks the first domino, nothing is going to happen. So something has to start this. And it's a logical conclusion that something that as st is, is starting at all has to be something that does not have a start. Um, so that would be, be, be one example we, we, we looked at. And then you kind of think, okay, maybe there has to be something out there. But like I said, I wasn't necessarily against the idea of there being something out there. I just never really thought about it. Um, but then we, 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 we could move to another topic like, okay, but there was order. Um, where does order come from? Because usually things don't order themselves. Um, if if you if you put uh, if you throw a uh, if you throw parts onto the ground, you don't expect them to assemble themselves. I mean, if you see a book, you would know that somebody put the letters in order. It didn't happen automatically. So generally, things kind of. Uh, go towards this order if there's no organizing structure to it. So where does this organizing structure come from that kind of governs the universe? Um, it, it can't really come from, from, from nowhere. And I suppose that's where the, the watchmaker kind of example comes from. Like if we see a watch, we assume there's a watchmaker. Um, but if you look at entropy, I mean, basically we know that the universe is running out of energy. So it all points toward that there has to be a beginning, but its beginning has to come from, from somewhere. Um, so there's loads of like little sites uh, discussions and, and things. We kind of started about uh, to talk about, okay, what is the beginning of the universe? Where does it uh, come from? How is it the way it is? How is this possible? Um, does it not make sense that there is uh, some kind of a creator uh, behind it all? And uh, slowly but surely, I kind of started to uh, to to accept that, I suppose, um, to start to accept that. Well, it makes more sense that there is actually uh, something that created this, rather than that it is all by chance, on that 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 there was no reason for it. Um, like even if you look at the world itself, why is the world here? I mean, it is the Earth is kind of in a, in a in a very sp a special place in the universe, in the spiral uh, universe we are. I mean, we are in a really protected space that we, we were not hit by any lethal radiations. There is no supernovas anywhere near us that can, uh, can, can cause our demise. So it allows life to flourish. We can observe the universe from where we are very, very well. Um, 
everything seems to be kind of like perfect. And I suppose it's a chicken and egg to a certain extent. You could say like, oh, well, there's life here because it's possible to flourish, but some people would say, but then on the other side, like, well, but there's no reason for it to be this way. And it is this way. And um, just to believe that, that it's all chance, just seems to be impossible to me. Doing the, the, the calculations of the Big Bang, it is impossible. But even looking at, at life itself, I mean, what if the universe started and all these molecules just ordered themselves in this huge like expanse in a way that you just the perfect earth here with atmosphere and everything, which is um, shielded by the planets around us. So we actually have an atmosphere, uh, not like Mars, which doesn't anymore. Um, so this all happened. And what then? Suddenly you get uh, a, a little lizard like creature that crawls out of the mud or out of the water. I mean, where does that come from? Like, where's that first little cell of that, that creature coming from? I mean, to make a cell is, is hugely complicated. Um, even to make a, the little, the, the, to make the amino acids that are needed for the cell membrane is hugely complicated. It doesn't happen. Again, it is order that doesn't, it's order that doesn't normally happen. Amino acids don't react in that way if there's not a, a catalyzer to actually put them together in that way. So again, you're looking at some kind of a design and these things have to be all in place if we, if we, if we follow macro, uh, macro evolution and say that everything just evolves from each other. It just doesn't, if you look, all these things kind of looked fine for me when I looked at the, I suppose the big picture, but when you actually start looking at the details, I just realized that it does not make sense that these things just happen spontaneously. I mean, think about DNA, where does DNA come from? If you have a library of information, usually somebody has written it down, you know, it doesn't just happen um, in all these things. Or, or if you look at evolution, I mean, there's no fossil evidence that macroevolution happened. I mean, the Cambrian explosion, which is a relatively short time, suddenly all these species kind of, uh, kind of arrive. And I mean, I suppose I was taught in school, like, oh yeah, but look, I mean, they have all kind of similar uh, ways the cells work. And so they must come all from the same source. But I'm an engineer. I mean, look at any, look at the plane and look at the car. A lot of the things work the same way. I mean, if you have a designer that designs something, it's more likely going to be designed it the same way. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, a car and a plane are related and come both from a bicycle. I mean, uh, no, it's just that engineers design way, the way things they, they are. And um, for me, it just became much more plausible uh, just because of the complexity that, um, uh, that, that, that there is a creator. It's like, I mean, if you throw a deck of cards into a hurricane, you don't expect, it, uh, expect a card house to stand there perfectly erect. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. And even when you mentioned there about like, um... Aquinas is five ways, you know, it's, it's like often these ways are taken individually and then they can be challenged in some way, shape or form. And someone might show some possibility that there might be a mistake in that. And, and what I mean by a mistake is, is they show a possibility of how one of the ways could be wrong. And they see that then as, oh, well, that's it. We've disproved everything. But of course, Aquinas' five ways weren't five proofs of God's existence. They're five ways because if we could prove God's existence, then we wouldn't have faith. We'd have, mm -hmm. you know, we, we'd have proof. So, um, so like, again, fine, Aquinas' five ways are not five individual proofs. They're, they're five individual ways when taken collectively take you a long way on that road mm -hmm. to understanding faith and understanding yeah. these things and it seems that you know Aquinas okay the great theologian and philosopher that he was he you know he wrote this and you know he had those five ways but you know Basil approached you in a similar kind of a way in that he met you where you were and challenged those those beliefs that you had because we can talk about um we can talk about agnosticism or atheism or whatever as being a lack of belief, but it's not. You still have some belief. Um, you know, you might 
you might have a belief that there is no God. You might have a belief that there might be a God. You might have a belief that there is some kind of a positive energy. You might have a belief in some, but you, you have a belief at the same time. And um, so it, it's about it's about challenging that that belief in in that way that that suits that suits that person and uh, and so at this point you know you're starting to kind of um you're starting to question things um but again basil hasn't come at you about morals or anything like that i think that often we can see a thing where someone comes and you know like you say this happened over many months um sometimes we can see that maybe in evangelization that someone might say oh well i think that you know that person is starting to get it so now i must make sure they get you know it's like oh today is thursday and they're kind of understanding me so it's like i must make sure they get the confession tomorrow or saturday and they must get the mass on sunday and you know all these kind of things but basil was gentle in in getting you there in god's time um but but not not so gentle that he wasn't going to challenge you, but he, he wasn't in a rush to get this all done in two or three days. No, no, he uh, he definitely took his time um, for these things. And actually, I don't think he ever really talked with Morris about me. Uh, I think he kind of think that, thought that those, those things would kind of take care of themselves to a certain extent, you know, that um, uh, I suppose then once I got interest in the faith, it just all made sense to me. So you kind of start to discover these things yourself. And and then you kind of see, okay, like even the church teachings and stuff, they kind of make sense. And then you are willing to accept them because they make it make sense rather than because they imposed on you. Um, so yeah, he never really, really did that. He just paved the way to a certain extent, uh, paved the way home, <laughs> paved the way to, uh, um, uh, to, to kind of see that God uh, God was there so I could open my heart to the possibility like okay this makes sense and then he led me the way to start to pray so I actually could encounter and experience myself uh, and discover God for myself rather than it just being a I suppose a scientific or or, or 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 yeah an intellectual concept to actually make it then connect to your life um, I suppose yeah, I'm I'm thinking there now as, as you say that I'm thinking about when I met my wife Mara. Um so when I met her, you know, it wasn't on the first date or second date that, you know, Mara set down rules or I set down rules and said, right, that's it. We're wife and girlfriend and you know, we can't look at anybody else and you know, that kind of thing. There was it was a case of we met in the bar, we got chatting. We swapped numbers, we text, we, we met up, went on a date, spent a night, spent a night in a bar chatting to each other. Another night we went for dinner, chatting to each other. And over time, meeting and, and, and kind of really growing into this, it, there was no rules laid down that, oh, you must do this or you must do that. It was, it was just simply, I wanted to come. And initially we were meeting up maybe weekly, fortnightly, weekly. And it was it was like that, and it's like no, I, I want I want more of this person, and the we'll say the relationship rules kind of formulate without ever being set in stone, and in the same way, that's that's what kind of happened to you with with faith, and uh, it wasn't morals and rules that were imposed initially. Yeah, exactly. You, you kind of uh, you 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 kind of grow, and then you start to accept and understand things as they 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 come and then you yeah, but then you can accept them as genuine being uh, the true i suppose to a certain extent yeah and so there's there's still a leap to be taken um so you, you're kind of you're rocked at this point but there's a leap to be taken from belief in god to belief in jesus as god you know mm -hmm. there there are many faiths out there that will you know there's i think in the history of the world they say in the history of, there's i think roughly 92 percent i think is what they kind of say of are, are, are kind of um believe in some kind of a uh, some kind of a, a god so what um what, what brought you to christianity um 
well, I suppose I, I it's, a, it's a question that's often asked. Sometimes it, I'm asked, oh, well, what if, if, if that would have been a Protestant? Would you be a Protestant? And uh, I might have well been. Um, although I would believe that the Catholic faith is the truth. So hopefully I would hope that I would end up there eventually when you start actually delving uh, deeper. If you're, and if you're interested in it, I think you would. Um, but uh, I suppose from, from uh, the, the accepting that there is possibly some kind of a creator of the universe, um, the, the, the kind of the, I suppose the investigation shifted to Christianity itself, uh, the Old Testament Bible a little bit, but especially then the New Testament to kind of see, okay, but then um, Christianity claims that God actually came and Jesus is, is God and came to the world uh, and, and sacrificed himself and, but for your for redemption, but then is this true? And I suppose to a certain extent, we went to, we looked at the Bible from a, a critical point as well in the historical um, critical method and things like that. Okay, but these stories, do they, are they actually true? Are they just made up? Are they true? Or how do we know they can be true? And I mean, there's all kinds of uh, things you can look at and uh, uh, like uh, historical, there's whole historical methods to do these things. So um, I had to kind of come to the conclusion that as a historical document, the Bible is as true as anything else, as any other historical document we have. And but that also meant that you have to kind of look at the person of Jesus that is portrayed in the gospels. And if there's no reason to, uh, to not believe that these are true events, then you kind of have to start asking yourself the question, if, if this Jesus is who he claims to be, if he does the things that he does and, and he says the things that he, he said, then you kind of have to make a decision. <laughs> I mean, if this is true, then it means something. And, uh, I suppose at this point, Basil gave me a Bible and said, okay, but if you just read a little bit of the New Testament, so just start with Matthew, read half a chapter or something like that uh, a day, which is five, 10 minutes, and, and say a little prayer and ask God to show himself, um, then he would first of all leave me alone for a while, which suited me because I was writing my thesis and um, Basil did come every day. Uh, faithfully to sit on my desk for an hour and a half, uh, or something like that. Uh, no, uh, but uh, no, we, I, I said, okay, I try. And he said, to see, try this for, for, for not for a day or two or two to two, a week or two, but like for a few months and see what happens. And um, I said, I gave this a go because there wasn't really any, uh, like the Pascal's wage. I mean, there wasn't anything to lose yet. I mean, there wasn't anything. Uh, yeah, I mean, it just, if this was true, I mean, it is like winning the lottery to a certain extent. If, if God came and, uh, and we can have, uh, we can know God and have a relationship with God and he has come um, uh, to prepare us, I suppose, to walk this way with him uh, to, to heaven. I mean, that actually sounded to me to make sense. And uh, so it was, it was a good thing to do. And uh, I said, I give it a go. And, and Bessel told me that he said, like, if this God is a God who we can personally know, then you would expect that he would reveal himself to you if he really asked him. So, uh, so yes, I, uh, I said I would do. I would say a little prayer each day and, uh, and, and uh, ask God to show me and I read a little bit of the Gospels. And I suppose that is then where uh, from all the the, the the reasoning and the, the looking at at, at 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 science at the bible at the history and all these kind of things then suddenly things change because then it suddenly becomes a personal experience as we encounter god in our own lives um and that is ultimately what's what makes believing worth believing uh it's probably it might be different for people who have uh, who have kind of been brought up with the faith and always have believed but if you didn't suddenly this 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 makes a uh, makes a difference and if if our our faith becomes alive and we really realize that god is actually present and acting in our lives and we can actually work with him uh it it is completely game changer it completely puts your life to a certain extent upside down um not just the outlook of life but also the experience of life yeah and you know i'm i'm just kind of thinking here even from the you know the the scientific point of view when you opened 
say even if you just went to Genesis one, um, you know, when when you're kind of seeing there are no incompatibilities straight off. Well, unless you want to read it as a scientific text, and then there's many. But like, but if you if you were to read it in the way that you know that that we do read Genesis one, you know, you can see that in the beginning it starts with in the beginning, and then you're kind of saying, well, hang on, for prior to the Big Bang, the widely believed thing was that the world always existed. The Big Bang kind of pinpointed a starting point, and then we realize that and that's you know scientifically accepted and then we can come along that's that's it's the best science to date and then we can mm -hmm. find that the bible which you know predates this is saying yeah there was a starting point even when the world believed that there wasn't the bible is saying there is so so there's many different little things like that that are probably when you're looking at it from your point of view these things are kind of saying yeah okay you know th there's no conflict yet and so you can you can trust it and, yeah. and leave that little bit further. Well, that's I mean that's one of the important things I think that we can uh, if we if we like for example like you say in the first chapter of Genesis if we look at it, it's not written as a, a history book. It is not it's not written to to explain exactly what scientifically happened. No, it was written in a kind of a mythical way or whatever way. I'm not really a linguistic I'm an engineer, but. Uh, um, in a way that could be understood by the people at the time. And I suppose we can still understand it, even if it is not written in scientific language. But I mean, even if, if you talk about the seven days, well, I, I, if you, I, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but eon, the word used for, for what we translate as day, just means time period. So kind of to see in Genesis that it is kind of described as a process of involvement seems to me not completely incompatible incom uh, with what we knew from uh, from from scientific research into a possible to of a a some kind of a, a big bang or something like that something that, that that has those those features and what i'm also struck by now is again it's the approach i think the approach that was taken here is just you know i, I think it's it's we can learn so much from it um because Again, it wasn't morals that that it it came at you from, and I think that there is such a a temptation to begin with morals, um, and but when we begin with morals, what we're really saying to someone is that, like like you you just said there a while ago that you had nothing to lose. You know, if if this is true, you have nothing to lose. You have everything to gain. But if we begin with morals, I think we have an awful lot to lose. We have the way we're living our lives. We have to lose that, and it's and you know we're, we're aware that we do have to lose that. You know, mm -hmm. so I think that um, that can be that can be the burdensome thing of of uh, faith. I remember being on a pilgrimage years ago, and um, so we we were kind of uh, maybe late twenties, early thirty, something like that, when we um, kind of started taking the got the wake up call and started taking the faith seriously and i remember um coming back from a pilgrimage and meeting people who were 19 20 that kind of way and i remember them they were saying to me like oh you're so lucky because you got to live out your 20s in whatever wild way you wanted to live them and then you could come into the faith. they said whereas we have the burden of this faith thing now and it's just you know i, I remember one fella saying to me he said oh he's like i'm I'll, all my friends he said they know no better so uh he's like they'll be grand but now i know better he was like they can have fun and i can't you know and it's that mindset um mm. that it's a, when we come at it purely from a moral point of view um it can just be this burden that it might necessarily be that we're it may not be that someone is choosing to be ag agnostic or or atheist or something like that from um, that they've taught it through. It might just be a kind of a running from the truth because if I question it and it is true, all of these different things will have to change and blah, blah, blah. So mm. it's easier to run from. Whereas whereas you're you're just more questioned on on the the bigger things uh, on where you are and 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 you know it was trusted that the morals would just come. You weren't preached that. I, I think that's just so powerful. 
Well, there's something about the, the truth set you free. And I think the encounter with the truth is something that that always always changes us and, and kind of see and this, I mean, it's 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 discovering of, of what is really true, true, good and beautiful. Um, if we discover this, it's something we want to have. And I suppose that's the whole thing of it's not our faith is not supposed to be an external thing, but it is supposed to be an internal thing. I mean, that is the whole thing of grace. Grace works. I mean, grace changes us. It it transforms us. We grow in virtue. I mean, living according to, uh, I suppose, the commandments. I mean, ultimately, the, the commandments are there to kind of uh, keep us on the line. But if we live a life, if we live a life uh, of grace, then it's not that the, the rules and the commandments that kind of uh, that determine what we do. It is because we want to live that way. That is the way we are. I mean, like like some people are nice and some people are not. <laughs> but the people who are nice don't make themselves nice, and the people who are not don't want to be that. You know, it is who we are. But through grace, we change. So um, most people don't need the commandment, thou shall not kill, because we have absolutely a well, hope. <laughs> that is not the reason we're not killing, you know, it's because we don't want to. I mean, because we don't feel that inclination, that, that need. So to a certain extent, it's with everything. If we grow in closeness with God, it's actually something that has to be active because it changes us actively from the inside um, as, as grace transforms us. And that is something I really experienced that it actually does change. Now, I mean, I, I must say to a certain extent, if somebody, if we have, we have a conversion and whatever life we are living, we realize we have to change, it is a hard decision. For me, the decision at the time didn't have an awful lot of consequences, uh, I suppose, to a certain extent. So that makes it maybe easier, but it doesn't take away from the fact that it's still worth doing. I mean, that, that something is easier to, to choose doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that it is it, it that in other other in other circumstances it, it is um, it's not worth it. No, it's always worth choosing it, but sometimes it just takes a little bit more effort. And and I suppose once I once I, I because I once I kind of started praying and it became clear that God existed, I had to make a decision to be baptized. I had to do something with it. It was either Okay, just go off and leave it all behind, or decide then to become baptized because that is ultimately what we, I suppose, need to what 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 it is about. So um, I decided to to be become baptized then, but then after a while I got a girlfriend, and then obviously you need to kind of, yeah, you need to live according to what you believe in. But you would also believe that that is life giving, and and that is. Uh, it just means you can maybe not always do what you want or feel that you want to do. But I mean, it's not a big deal at the same time because I mean, it's life giving and it, it gives you get a lot out of your faith. And you know, uh, it, it's all to build up the future and to, to, to go to, uh, to, to something good because the hope is always there. I don't know if that's the way, right way to express it. But I mean, so ultimately, I, th I think this, yes, yeah, sometimes it can no. be maybe hard, but it is something we, we, it is worthwhile doing. I know what you mean. And when you're saying there, actually, again, another just another beautiful part of this story is is the fact that, you know, Basil, you've mentioned the word free, the truth will set you free. And, you know, again, there, Basil didn't like take you captive as a, you know, Chris, and this is what you must do, and you must do it this way and that way, and another way. It was just a case of, you know, you know, go and pray and, and do this over a period of time and see how you grow. And it was it was a free internal thing. And I think there's something beautiful there because again, when we look at it purely from morals, and you know, a lot of the time the morals are kind of they're imposed, you know, and, and it's people meaning well. Like, I mean, there, you know, there, there's no doubt about that. It's it's when people mean well, they say, Oh, well, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that, and you know, different things. But that prayer life and that um that kind of thing hasn't developed yet at this point and i think when the morals are kind of imposed from an external point of view then you can be doing the things out of a sense of duty without internally feeling free mm -hmm. enough to love then the faith can become when temptations can come i think temptations can definitely come a lot easier especially then like that you know those people who are 
you know, who, who, who are saying those things to me, you know, late teens, kind of early twenties and, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, they kind of felt more that these morals were being imposed on them externally before there was an interior kind of love and freedom to do anything about it. And um, yeah, I, I think there's just something beautiful there in, in that way of kind of um, encouraging you to pray and again, allowing God's time to do the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that's the, um, it, it's allowing God to work. It's important for us because ultimately that is the, the thing that will, will keep us going. Um, it is, it, 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 it is not about subscribing to a, uh, some kind of a, a, a moral doctrine. Uh, no, it is getting the freedom of how to actually live it. And that, I suppose, comes from that only way that can come is by, by encountering God. So if we, to a certain extent, scare people off before they, uh, they can open their heart and, and encounter that, then um, the chances are that they won't. And especially if, again, for me, it was maybe slightly different because if you don't know anything, you're interested, well, I'm interested in learning. Um, you're interested in learning in it. It's sometimes a little bit harder, especially when people already think they know everything about the faith, which is with a lot of people, I suppose, who have gone to, uh, to, a, to a school system where it is educated and a society where it, 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 it's much closer than in the Netherlands where it has gone for a longer time. Um, it is, it, 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 we, we, we need, especially then, that to walk with them, to kind of guide them and discover what, what it is first before I suppose before giving rules and regulations and telling what is the right way to live or not. Yeah, because I suppose when when we do it that way too, we're we're just hearing an awful lot about Jesus without ever actually encountering him, like you are encountering him now at this stage through the gospels. And yeah. you know, you you can formulate opinions, thoughts, whether your thoughts and opinions are incorrect or not at least you can then go back to Basel and you can bounce some of them things off and mm -hmm. he can, you know, you can, can debate things or he can straighten out things where you're maybe a little crooked or, you know, those kind of things. But, but you're encountering Jesus in, in his word. And mm -hmm. as opposed to constantly just being told about him. Yeah. Um, yeah. You need, it, it, it is the encounter that really changes it. And like, it, it was even, like I said, it was best to said, okay, I'll leave you alone and, and do this experiment of, of praying each day a little bit and um, talking, uh, of reading the gospel a little bit and let God do the work, you know. And, and to a certain extent, I must say that that, 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 has, that has actually shows a lot of charism to a certain extent, to be able to trust in God, um, to say, okay, I step back and it's not my knowledge or intellect that's going to uh, convert him. But it's actually God who's going to do it. And I trust in God to actually do it. You know, because he did tell me, God will show you. God will reveal. And I don't know if I always have sometimes. It's kind of the feeling I, I just want to make sure that God, God is asleep, you know, <laughs> to make sure that it actually happens. No, but he was very, he had a lot of trust in, yeah. in that God would actually work it out, you know. God will do it. You know, th there's there's a lot of um, kind of uh, similarities here and 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 kind of uh, traits of John the Baptist in a way. Like you know, you say it, it's someone who's not afraid to speak out, not afraid to speak to people and and things like that. And uh, you know, so Basil has that, but then he also has that kind of that that humility to uh, of you know where John the Baptist says, uh, "I must decrease." And he must increase, you know, and mm -hmm. it's like, it's at that point, because like you say, it's, that's a tough thing at times, you know, to kind of, yeah, to trust us, to trust that God has this, you know, that it's kind of like, we can say we do, but a lot of time it's like, oh yeah, of course, I, I trust that God can guide that person, but I also have to do, you know, I have to, and, and when we do that, we can probably be undoing a lot of the good that's being done. Mm. Yeah, because especially because I mean, as human nature is very impatient. We want to see things happen quickly and, and and things like that. And God works very slow most of the time. So at this point now, you you've been um, baptized, and now you have a girlfriend. So um, they're clearly by the habit on you 
your uh, story doesn't end there. So, uh, so what's what's the next step now? Um, I suppose the next step was just kind of to learn to live like a, a Christian. I suppose that's why the, why the church is is quite wise in the fact that uh, a recently baptized is not allowed to um, to join the priesthood or religious life for about four years. Um, not that I necessarily want, was going to do that. That wasn't uh, necessarily in my plan. Um, I, but I was kind of from the beginning said, okay, God, whatever your will is. But I assumed, I was hoping, I assumed that it was just going to be to have a family. Um, uh, maybe with a good job that I could do some, some good to the church as well. If I could work part-time and make enough to I suppose make a living and then have some time to do other things, uh, I would have loved to, to do that or do something that is directly involved in spreading the faith. Uh, but I just took it day by day and then I had a job, I suppose, and just kept working uh, for the next, uh, what's about four years. Um, so, so I went, uh, I was going out for three years of it. Um, and uh, yeah, that was, that was going grand. At one point, I suppose there was just a, a moment uh, as, as there is in relationships where things are maybe not uh, all uh, as good and um, she just asked if she could have a little bit of, 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 of space just to kind of think about things. It was kind of a stressful uh, time because uh, um, she was finishing off uh, a, a degree in primary school or a postgrad by primary school, um, a lot of teaching practices and I was setting up a company which is also quite um, time consuming. And uh, so uh, she said she wanted to have a break. And I just, I was on my way to a conference in Dublin, Catholic conference. And uh, I just said to God, well, I mean, if you want me to do something else, then I, I, I'm always available, you know? But I never really believed in even thinking about the priesthood or something like that, if like marriage was approaching, which it kind of was. So um, I never thought about breaking up a good relationship, but then, at that moment, I kind of thought, well, I mean, maybe this is God's will, you know? So I prayed and it became quite clear to me that maybe that is what God is asking me to do. So that is why I decided to at least give it a try and, uh, and, 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 and talk to a Dominican. And then the spiritual director was a Dominican and eventually joined the Dominicans um, and then discovered that actually the Dominicans, because I didn't know, I mean, I was only Catholic for four years. I didn't know that much about orders. Um, and that actually was very close to my heart, uh, especially from the faith and reason kind of point of view and um, being able to marry them and the sentiments of, of the world and to some extent in the theology. So, um, yeah, and to preach and go out and preach and, and, and spread the message to those who, who don't know it properly or don't know it at all. Um, so kind of maybe it was God's plan after all uh, to be here. And, you know, um... So, so that that girl you were uh, going out with, and she asked to to take some time. Um, so, you know, afterwards when you'd have spoken or anything like that, you know, are, are you kind of um, saying to her at that stage you you've had the call? Are you kind of saying, "Sorry, I've met someone. I've met someone else." Well, it was difficult, uh, very difficult, because it wasn't that I didn't like her. You know, I mean going on for three years so yeah. I mean um, but I did believe that if God is asking that 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 would be the way to happiness for both of us I suppose and I you kind of have to believe that um, I think so yeah so it was a very difficult breakup uh, because it was a breakup neither of us really want to happen but at the same time I I kind of was quite strong that I have to try it because if I don't try it then uh, it will always be kind of something on my mind you know I mean if you get married things are not always perfect for most people um, so you kind of in those moments you would always think oh maybe I, I did the wrong thing you know I should have done I should have responded to the call that time um, uh, so I was quite aware that uh, whatever vocation you choose, that has going to have its challenges. But at least I thought if I try this, if I go and join the novitiate and, and do at least six months, nine months, I should have a fair idea if this is what God is asking me to do. And if not, then we see what we do. Get, get married or whatever happens. I mean, you can assume, of course, that you can go back. But um, 
then we, I can look at that avenue, but at least I have closed that chapter then. So I suppose that was part of my, my thinking just uh, at the time. Uh, but I must, must say that like once I joined, I never really looked back at the, I mean, it was quite clear, uh, I think to me at least, that it is maybe what God is asking me to do. You know, what I'm really struck by throughout this story is the amount of um, trust and surrender at different points. So, I mean, initially, you know, um, Basil trusts in, um, he trusts in God in, in approaching you. You don't kind of put up this attitude of, I know everything. Um, leave me alone. I'm, I I know how the world works. Leave me alone. I have my ideas. You you kind of you accepted that. Uh, you accepted the challenges. You you entered into that that um, that conversation. And I think I think that's something that's missing a lot today. Um, you know, it doesn't matter whether the conversation is on um, the existence of God or whether the conversation is on a presidential candidate or whatever it is. It's what what we're missing a lot today is this ability for two people of different thought processes to be able to actually dialogue and to you know to to be able to say yeah I, I can actually think outside of my own thinking you know I I, I can think of I can think about the things that I don't I can think about things that are outside of my own preconceived notions and and things like that and so. You know, you you kind of you trusted um you trusted Basil to have these conversations, but then also you were able to surrender your position. Um, you know, I'm impressed with that. And then but then again, Basil's trust in surrendering you to God then as well is, you know, that's um that's impressive. And uh I'm very impressed by that. But then again, even in this situation, you know, with, with this you know, with this girlfriend, you you're in the position where you kind of say, "Well, I can trust that I can surrender myself to God. That if if He's calling me, I trust that if He's calling me, then this is what's going to be good for both of us." And there's a lot of trust and surrender here, and it's you know it it's one of these things that obviously the story when when we put it like that, it sounds like there was never never a sleepless night or never a kind of a, a question about am I doing the right thing or not obviously there was but you know but it just does go to show that when we do surrender um even if we have to wrestle with things you know if, if we if we do have to wrestle with things but we do surrender to God and and do you know what he wants over what we want it does ultimately lead to you know the the happy path the path where we will be able to say down the line, I'm very happy where I am right now. Yeah, and I, but I, th I think that has to come from a, a, a relationship with God. I mean, uh, from from the same as with friendships, and I think going back to what we said a little bit earlier, like the authentic uh, uh, a friendship is important to, to walk with somebody and to bring people along. I mean, talking about friends and, and family and these kind of things. Um, I mean, it's the same with God. I mean, it, we have we only get trust in God if we allow if we allow ourselves to get to know God. Um, from that point of view, I mean, if we allow God to to step into our lives and we 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 yeah, we know that God wants the best for us and that He's not going to let us down. And that doesn't mean that everything is going to be perfect or that life is perfect or that there is no problems or no no uh, stress and things like that. But at the same time. Deep down, we know that things will be okay, and that uh, that we don't have to really worry, and that gives that gives peace, I suppose. Um, and uh, but I think that is part of it. We need to. It is from experience and and time spent with God that we we kind of get to that, um, like it is with any friendship, which is built on trust. Um, so, but again, it has to come from experience. It's not. It's not a fundamentalist kind of thing like, oh, God knows best, so we have to do because this is what I think God No, I mean, that is why it takes. That's why, like the church says, that's be four years. I mean, that's why when you're talking to people, 
about the fate of what they should be doing, you always kind of start like, oh, this is all great, but take it easy. <laughs> no, God works slowly. Uh, and uh, because we work slowly as well in, in building up trust and relationships. And um, uh, then you can do these things, I think. Um, then you can make uh, these decisions and, and follow it through and, um, and, it, and it will work out, um, even if you have to be patient. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I think as well, sometimes we can kind of wonder where he is in decisions because when we're trying to make decisions, we kind of want to hear this real internal strong conviction of absolutely this is what I must do and whatever, as opposed to kind of wrestling with things a little bit, you know, that we can kind of feel at times, um, you know, you're like, I, I think this is what I'm supposed to be doing, but I, you know, I you're kind of wrestling with it a bit and you're like kind of god what are you doing why you know why are you not answering me in my time immediately you know and it's um it's funny because i'm mean, even thinking of say my son michael there you know i was playing lego with him there the other evening and uh and he was building this big tower or whatever and uh so i was building it and you know with him and then uh we knocked it over and later he was building it and he was like oh, dad, come and help me. You know, he was like, help me. I was like, oh, I will later. And what I was doing is I just, that time, I didn't want to go and build it with him. I wanted to wait outside. And I was like, I knew he was building it. And I wanted him to build it on his own and, and wrestle with it and kind of learn that if he puts the bigger pieces on top, it's going to fall over. I wanted him to learn some of those things that, you know, I had told him those things earlier, but I needed him to do it on his own now. And then, you know, and then as it's going, then I came in, you know, later on. But um, I just, I needed him to be able to, because it, he'd, be, he'd be so much better for it himself if I just, and of course, when I say I left him alone, I wasn't leaving him alone. I was, I knew exactly what he was doing. I was, I was watching him, you know, from a distance that time. But I, I was, I was no less with him than I was earlier when he was making it. Yeah, no, I think um, it, it, that is, I suppose, in our fate, it's a lot of times as well. God let us make our own decisions, and we kind of have to find our own ways. Uh, very similar, even that He is there to kind of help us and guide us, and and is there for us. I mean, it's not always clear cut. I mean, but that is the thing. I mean, we we have our freedom, and that's what God wants too. God wants us to choose Him uh, freely, not because he can build towers for us, uh, but because we want him to be there, you know. Uh, not saying that Michael just wants you there to be tower, build towers for you, uh, for him. But um, no, um, it, uh, that is what God wants too. I mean, it is uh, so. Sometimes in life, it is it's difficult. And was it clear for me that I should do this and that? Not necessarily, but it was clear enough for me to think that I had to, 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 to make a conviction to actually try and do it. And uh, was it clear the whole time then, not reading up after I, I had to break up with a girlfriend and go on before I was starting the novitiate, was that easy? No, there wasn't much consolation at all. But again, when I made the decision, I really thought that this is what God is asking me to do. So the logical thing to a certain extent was to kind of see it through and continue um so that is what i did uh i i went went through and then when i started praying in the novitiate it was quite clear that god uh, was very close but it didn't always feel that way but sometimes we have to yeah build our own towers and uh, but know that god is there and he will help us um at the times that that are needed and he's sometimes very close to us but sometimes we just have to walk alone as well uh, but that's part of life but it makes sense too, to a certain extent. So, I mean, again, I think if we grow in faith, we kind of, these things, we might not always like them, but they kind of make sense. So it is not unexpected to a certain extent that life is this way. Yeah. And, and again, like that, if you had decided not to become a priest and you wanted to, to marry that God, it's not like, you know, God would have respected your decision. You know, it, it's not like, he'd have blocked it and every single thing you'd ever have tried to do every door would have been closed because this was the only one open and you know as if you're a robot and he's forcing you down one avenue it's he he invited you to priesthood but would have respected any avenue you'd have chosen 
not exactly that the same God would have supported. And I would always, I would always have thought of, uh, of I'm always I would have been convinced of that, that whatever I would have chosen, that God would be in it. But I also, well, at the same time, I uh, believe that God will maybe ask us to do something specific and then uh, naturally we try to, uh, uh, yeah, we try to do that. Um, and that is what I try to do. And I think it's more for, for yourself. Like I said, I said, if I don't try this, it might always be in my mind. It's not that because God was going to judge me if I had chosen a different direction in that he was going to make life miserable, but it would be in my mind because the inevitable difficulties and hardships of life, I would automatically read into, oh, this is because I didn't choose. I mean, you know, you always think that the other, the other side of the valley is always greener. So, um, so to a certain extent, yeah. apart from the fact that I thought God was asking me, I wanted to try it just because um, I thought it was a good thing. But I also believe that, yeah, that is, uh, that, was, uh, that, that, that that would bring happiness and peace um, in general, uh, because otherwise you'd just always be wandering. And, and so what year did you enter into uh, the Dominicans? Uh, summer 2007. So I've been a while here. 2007. We, yeah, we so you were ordained years. then? 14, <laughs> 2014. Wow. Wow. So se so, seven yeah, so seven years, years this summer. Seven years this year. <laughs> so that's, that's yeah. incredible. And, and, and you're, you're in Cork. What year did you move to Cork? Uh, it will be, May will be three years. So I was four years in Newbridge yeah. before Jeez. I came to Cork. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And so like, it's, it's an incredible story. Like, you know, we can, sometimes we listen to kind of more dramatic, um, you know, kind of uh, conversion stories or, you know, things like that. That's, um, you know, the, this one isn't um, dramatic in, in kind of the sense of, in many senses, it's, it's not dramatic, but, but it's, I just think it's a beautiful, powerful one, but it, I'm really struck by the, the the power of the authentic witness of of Basil in in that having that that kind of conviction and going to you, but going to you in faith and going to you where you're at. And I think that that's that's the thing because with um with young people now, you know, millennials, we're more of a kind of a there's a lot more kind of questioning and there's you know there's a there's a lot of questioning and, and kind of need to know the whys of things before agreeing to do anything, not just faith, anything. You know, there's just, you know, there's a lot of kind of you have to convince, you know, people of, of things, kind of the, the why bother. And, and but when it comes to the faith, then um, it, sten it still tends to be usually the similar kind of um, the same sticking points kind of keep come out there might be there might be questions on the moral things you know the, the sexual issues and things like that they'll usually be a kind of a, a question around that um because i guess it's just it's in the culture and so you know christianity is kind of countercultural. so um so in that they kind of they'll need to know a lot more of the kind of the why but then Science is a huge thing. There is that misconception that, you know, um, science has disproved the faith and so on. But there are so many resources out there. Like there, we really, that's one of the, the beauties of kind of the technological age is that, you know, if we just go into type in Catholic apologetics, you know, or, you know, Catholic teach, not just teachings on something, but more the, the apologetics are, are, are the best because they give you those, those reasons and those arguments and, not arguments in the in the sense of the word of shouting people down, but you know that that kind of the, the those those kind of um strong the kind of the the reasons behind things and that so we can explain them to people and uh, I think that again like Basil I think we can we can all learn from from that that if we if we learn areas of our faith better and particularly the areas that will the questions that those around us or our friends or family who've maybe fallen away from the faith questions that they have or the sticking points for them or 
you know, different things. I think, but not just to go with them with answers, but go with them with questions, I think. Like you said, you know, Basil came to you with, with questions and questioning your beliefs on things. And then we can enter into a discussion and we can we can give those. So I think we can give those answers. And I think that's um that's a beautiful thing that I've, you know, I've really kind of taken from uh, from this today. And and again, it's not just about Googling Catholic apologetics uh to find um the answers. There are many courses being run and it I suppose it's one of the beauties of one of the very few beauties of this lockdown situation is that there are far more courses being run from the comfort of our our own houses, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. That is that is definitely one of the things. And even yesterday, I was talking with a group like when we talked about the, uh, doing different programs of of helping encouraging people to kind of share the faith and things. Like a year ago, I wouldn't have thought about doing that on a Zoom call, and we might not do it at a Zoom call now because we're so well. <laughs> let's say saturated with zoom calls but i mean if we when we're back to normal kind of um to actually kind of uh, keep using the 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 things we have learned i suppose and how the technology has evolved to actually use it for for the greater good but i mean like you said the, um, yeah there has been a lot of uh it, it has been good that way uh, that we have been able to organize um courses and things like that in general, I mean, there's been quite quite a bit of opera, and we have done our own uh, our own series here in St. Mary's in, in Cork as well. But then it doesn't have to be St. Mary's in Cork to that extent because everybody can uh, tune in. Um, but like, and we did an advent, we did a series, and we're now running a series again uh, next week, starting I think in uh, for Lent as well. Uh, uh, just a, a, a set of various courses people can tune into. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think particularly for people from Cork, actually, um, you know, dominicanscork.ie is a, a website that's definitely worth um, keeping an eye on because it's um, it's well updated. But there's there's always so much going on. Um, you know, there aren't many different courses, be it some some in apologetics actually, and and uh, particularly for people from Cork because um, with these courses they might be run online at the moment when we can meet in person some will be transferred to normal. being in person so it'll be yeah so, yeah, yeah normal that's uh whatever whatever that'll be like so we can remember normal at this stage but uh, people. yeah no that's that's wonderful so um yeah so yeah that's it that's it so kind of from your own situation kind of for for tips on on maybe evangelizing family or friends or anything like that you know i suppose we, we've spoken a lot about it but have you any from your own experience then have you any kind of um kind of i suppose have you any advice and and i suppose also not just on on that but you've touched earlier on on the importance of actually kind of um living what we believe and um I suppose that that being number one, but you know, if you if if you have any advice for people, well, I don't think I do. When it comes to family, because my family are not uh, Catholic, and my brother and sister are not baptized, and apparently, I haven't done really much <laughs> good in that way. Whatever, eighteen, fifteen, seventeen years later, um, but um, uh, I think family is always very difficult. So I think family generally, I would think, would be the example is what kind of has to rub up especially once kind of the children i suppose become independent thinkers um you kind of you, you have to almost rely on others i think it's probably the wrong way to go about it but to a certain extent there is a point where where family they don't accept the authority anymore of parents to a certain extent or generalizing obviously um it's not always the case but that you would hope that it would come to other sources as well um and that is i suppose what's important to children grow up uh, that what they do like for example i think i'm involved in the catholic scouts where they they learn the faith you would hope they get it on school or to choose a school that they would get it uh, so that it becomes a natural kind of element but then there would always be a point where they have to make the decision themselves you can give so much knowledge and, and things ultimately it's the it's the own 
decision. And for most uh, who are, I know, who are active in the faith and uh, especially who are younger, I mean, it comes at some stage. Some have faith strong the whole time, but a lot, a lot also kind of might dip a little bit uh, away at the end of secondary school and maybe the beginning of college, but very soon discover that they don't really find uh, what they're looking for there and, and come back. And that's what you kind of would hope that you would have that the seeds are planted there and that people would kind of come back. And after that, I think um, if it just comes to people around, I think just be authentic. I mean, authentic is, these are, is so important. Authentic friendships, um, being able to talk with people about these things. But I mean, that, that, that requires credibility and that comes from an authentic life and, and a genuineness uh, in friendship, I think. Uh, that's very important. Yeah, yeah, that, that's true because I think you know, especially when we might go out with friends who who don't kind of who don't believe, there can be the there can be, I suppose, the temp. There's a couple of different temptations. There's the one to just jump in and preach, um, and kind of you know, there's the other is to kind of decide to park up the Catholicism for the night and kind of you know join them, um, you know, uh, totally. Whereas I suppose the the real beauty is in joining them, but bringing the joy and peace of the way we're living, and then and then finding those moments to to just question their beliefs. I think that maybe all too often we don't listen to other people. We do all the ta- talking without mm. ever listening to what people believe. Yeah, and to be able to to listen to them and see where they are at, and then. Okay, that's supposed to help them to see that God can be in there as well, or how that could be, or even in small little ways, you know. Um, I think sometimes, like if 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 it is known that somebody is an active believer, not necessarily preaching, but is open enough about it that people know. I mean, people would come on occasion to ask for prayers and things like that, like in the office or whatever, in in ways that you wouldn't expect or, or people you wouldn't expect, because you know, people do see. I do think people see it um so they they would recognize it but we have to we have to find a balance between being too active in promoting it i suppose and, and turning people away but if we don't do anything if we don't say anything if we don't come stand up for faith at all then obviously it, it goes on notice to a certain extent as well yeah because like i think that the bad witness yeah you know I'm, I'm kind of i'm reminded of i think it was a gandhi's quote um i like your christ i just don't like your christians mm-hmm. Um, you know, and uh, and then the other one, uh, Jordan Peterson said something um, one time when he was asked why he hasn't kind of um, fully uh, converted to Christianity because you know it looks like he's quite close, and you know at times, and and he was asked, and you know I was really struck by something he said. He said um, that it's the enormity of what he's actually, mm. what he would be taking on, the seriousness of what he's, what he'd be taking on is, is what kind of strikes him. And I think, um, you know, that's something that maybe we don't always actually give any consideration to the enormity of what we have taken on. And and in, in doing so, if we kind of take it on in a half living kind of way, we can do a lot of damage with that. Um, mm. You know, whereas, and that's not to take it on in a mad preachy way, but, you know, it, it just in a, in that living that joyful peaceful life that that, that witness is just yeah that that can be a, a beautiful thing mm-hmm. yeah so father luke thanks so much for joining us today so we just yeah, ask you thanks. to uh, to give a, a blessing to uh, our our listeners okay well thanks for inviting me and it was uh, it was nice uh even if it's a little bit different than the usual uh, chats we might have um so in the name of the father the son the holy spirit amen so Lord, we just ask your blessing upon um, all those who listen and all those who participate in paving the way home, uh, that it may always be your spirit that touches hearts and that converts lives, uh, and that we always may have an openness uh, to your presence uh, within our lives. We we'll ask God's blessing to come upon you all in the name of the Father and the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks very much, Father Luke. Okay, thank you. God bless. Amen.